I feel like almost um, the steward at the uh, the uh, wedding in John chapter two. Hearing that music this morning, just both groups. I, I have to tell you, you've done us all a disservice. You you saved the best wine for last. Oh my. Um, just amazing the talent of these children and then uh yes those two voices um i was almost going to say hey let them let them do a couple of songs that was that was beautiful absolutely beautiful and you know um there are some people who give too much emphasis to music and then there are some people who don't give enough emphasis to music do you know that um martin luther during the Reformation, actually believed that Europe was changed more by the hymns that were sung than even by his preaching. Because the people would hear and remember the truth of God's word that was being sung to them. And I think that's true for all of us, isn't it? I mean, I have to work so long to just memorize one verse, but it seems like I can remember a song the minute that I hear it. And Ephesians and Colossians both tells us that music is didactic. That means the worship of God has a specific purpose that it's not only vertical, but it's horizontal. It is to teach Songs and hymns and spiritual songs, we admonish one another, we encourage one another. And so there is a way in which um, that, that, that music uh, is preaching, it's proclamation, it's bringing forth God's word. And, and also that's a good word for a lot of the more modern music um, that sometimes, oftentimes is not very theological, theological. Well, it's theological, it's just not correct in its theology. Or, uh, I have no problem with a lot of instruments, I guess, but sometimes there's so much noise, I can't even hear what's being said. And it defeats the purpose of, of communicating truth. Communicating truth. So, man, I really... Uh, if I ever come back here again, please have those people sing more. <laughs> that's a, that's a, amen. Yeah, <laughs> if they'll sing more, <laughs> that was that was just beautiful. It, it encouraged me. Well, let's go back to Romans twelve. Verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, just to uh, summarize what we've learned so far, we have the Apostle Paul urging us, exhorting us, even begging us. Here we can see that the Apostle Paul was not just a theologian that um, cared only about truth. He cared about people. And he was here, well, here we can see his pastor's heart. He genuinely cares for these people in Rome, and he's begging them, urging them to do the right thing. And what is that right thing? To present their bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. That the greatest thing that we can do, the most reasonable thing that we can do, is surrender our lives totally to Christ. Now, when Paul says present, it's a once kind of, a, he's not saying do this over and over, but it's a once and for all decision. Now, we know that's true, but at the same time, we have to make decisions every day, every hour. We have to remember that decision that we made to lay down our lives for him. And also, I want you to know that, that none of us have accomplished this totally, none of us. But we should all be like the Apostle Paul who says, look, I forget what's behind and I keep pressing on. I keep pressing on to want to lay down my life more. One of the things that I loved about being in the mountains of Peru, whenever you would meet a fellow brother, 
hiking through the mountains. Maybe we were going up to take Bibles somewhere and maybe a farmer who was a believer was coming down with some goods on his donkey or his mule. If you asked them, if you said, ¿Cómo estás, hermano? How are you, brother? They would always say this, avanzando, avanzando, which meant advancing, advancing. I'm advancing. That's where believers ought to be. You know, I can be with... Um, and I know that you can say the same thing. I can be with immature believers who maybe are really struggling in a lot of areas of their life. But if they are struggling, and if they are advancing little by little, I feel right at home. I feel right at No judgment. It's the self-satisfied carnal person that you have to say, look, I really, I really don't have a lot of fellowship with this kind of person. But even but the broken, trembling, struggling, advancing believer, oh, what a beautiful thing. And if it's a beautiful thing to the people of God, how much more beautiful is it to God? Because a broken, a contrite heart, He will not despise. You know, folks, Christianity is the only religion where we can admit that we are wrong without having to be afraid. As a matter of fact, it is a benefit. If a person will just look at the Word of God and say, I'm not there, man, that's the first step in getting there, isn't it? It's actually looking at this stuff and saying, yeah, I need to change. Well, he says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Remember again, we're a culture that always talks about its heart. You know, I love Jesus in my heart, even though nothing in my life conforms to Christ's will. You can't judge me because you can't look in my heart. Well, none of that is true. Uh, what is in your heart is going to be revealed through your mouth, the direction of your life, the things you do. So you see, he's telling us, look, let's not be romantic or poetic here. Let's be real. Offer your bodies. Offer your hands and your mind and your eyes and your lips and every part of you to God. Holistically, everything that we have belongs to God and is to be for His glory. And he says that he wants us to be a living sacrifice. He wants us to be zealous for good deeds. But he also wants us to realize that we cannot live for God apart from God's life in us. We need to be praying for constant, constantly praying for greater and greater manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, this is true. The moment you were converted, you received the Holy Spirit, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and you are complete in Christ. And yet, as Spurgeon so often said, we have faith, don't we? We are saved, but we cry out for more faith, don't we? We have been given grace. We are Christians, but we cry out for more grace, don't we? We have been given the Holy Spirit, but should we not cry out for greater and greater manifestations of His, li of His life in us? And when I mean greater and greater manifestations, I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, these extraordinary miracles. I'm talking about the extraordinary miracle of a changed life, the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, I would trade all these things that people often want to see, all these miraculous walking on waters and, and um, speaking in tongues and visions and dreams and all the things that so many people desire, I'd trade all of that just to be, just to have the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all those things. I, I, that's my problem. I mean, if you want, go ahead, be a miracle man. I just want to look like Jesus. And, and that's my biggest problem. It's my wife's biggest problem in relationship to me. It's, it's, it's my children's biggest problem is that their dad is not as filled with the Holy Spirit as he ought to be, and he's not bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit as he ought to be. And, and let me say something else just really quick. You know, we've talked a little bit about family. You know, you can put all kinds of rules on your family and this is going to lead to death. But a father, the mother filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's something that provides fertile ground for the growth of children. 
a legalistic, mean-spirited, angry home is not going to produce anything. But the filling of the Holy Spirit, joy. Well, so we're to offer our lives as a living sacrifice and as a holy sacrifice. My dear friend, listen to me. The Word of God is just this beautiful revelation. And you cannot say that it's specifically about this certain thing or it's specifically about this certain thing. It's about so many things. But there is one thing that I can say, just one of the small things about the Word of God is this. It teaches us to think as God thinks. And that means it teaches us to love what God loves. And it also teaches us to hate what God hates. Really. Truly. You know, there are some things that that we should hate. Now, I said things. I didn't say people. There are some things that we should hate. Those things that defile us. You know, I was listening to some stories yesterday from people here. You know, things that they were doing to try to help other broken people. And I just kind of walked back to my trailer and, and, and I, was, I was really angry. And I was angry at sin. Do you realize every problem in this world is attributed to sin? To people doing the things that God hates? The little children that are just destroyed in their minds and their hearts because of sin? The things that go on in this world, all of it is attributed to sin. And so God, God tells us that He hates sin. And He hates sin because it destroys the very things that He's made. We should, we should hate it. I was teaching in a university a few years ago in Europe. And I was talking about the law of God. And, and I, I brought up the fact that, that a lot of you are probably thinking, this is what I told the students, a lot of you are probably thinking, you don't want to hear anything about the law of God because it's so oppressive and restricting and restraining and it takes away your freedom. You know, we've all heard that, haven't we? And I said, would you just think for a moment about what you're saying? You don't want God's law because it keeps you from doing the things you want to do? Well, okay then, let's look at the law of God. And find out why does it make you so mad? Okay, let's look at one of them. Uh, Love your neighbor as yourself. You hate that law? Because it won't let you do what you want to do to your neighbor? Uh, Don't lie. You hate... That's oppressive to you? That means you must love lying that much? Don't take your neighbor's wife. That makes you mad and you consider that oppressive? And I just went down through a whole list of things. Don't murder. And I said, so this is the law you hate? What kind of people are you? As a matter of fact, I want to leave this building right now. I'm afraid. Do you see the point? God's law is good. And if we hate it, it must say something about us. We're not good. One person said, well, yeah, but God, you know, everything for him. Well, the only option other than that is everything for you. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Doesn't it make more sense that all worship and honor and glory should go to the one who made the entire world? Because the only other option, it goes to you. So you're lifting yourself above God when in fact you don't even own your next breath. So we ought to be a holy people. And it doesn't mean just rejecting sin, rejecting that which is wrong, but it also means clinging unto God, having a passion for God, loving God, seeing God as supreme. Now, here's here's a good question. Well, it's a good statement to make. Preachers are real famous for telling people what to do, but not telling them how to do it. So if I sit there and I say, you need to love God more. And you need to see God as supreme. And you're sitting there going, yeah, I know that. And you telling me that just makes me feel worse than I already feel. But now here's the million dollar question. How do I do that? 
That's like telling a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. It's, you know, it's impossible. So if I tell you, you ought to love God more, and I tell me I ought to love God more, the next question is, well, how do I increase my love for God? You tell me I ought to see God as supreme. How do I increase my opinion of God? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, here's the answer. Um, I love my wife now more than I did when we were married. I mean, now I look back on, on my love for her when we were married and I see that it was, it was pretty superficial compared to what it is now. Now, why do I love her more? It's because I know more about her. And I've experienced more time with her. Now, here's what you need to see, and I need to be careful here because I don't want my wife to run up here and beat me up while you guys are watching. I can say that about my wife even though she's not perfect. Okay? Over the years I have known her, I love her more because I have seen more virtue. I've also seen more flaws, but I've seen more virtue, and therefore I love her more. Now think about God. He is perfect. If your heart has been renewed by the Holy Spirit and you truly are a Christian, then the more you see of God's virtue, the more you will love Him. And that is why it's so important to teach on the attributes of God. Literally, if I started a seminary, which isn't going to happen, but if I ever started a seminary, and let's say it was a three-year seminary or six semesters, every semester the student would have to take two classes. Now, there'd be other classes, but every semester there would be two classes. One would be on the attributes of God, and the other would be on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would study that all three years. And then they would be told that you have just begun to study the attributes of God. You don't even know anything. You have just begun to study the gospel. So you need to know more about God. More about God. How do you do that? Through His Word. Through prayer. And through reading men and women who really knew God and knew the attributes of God. Tozer has a wonderful little book on the attributes of God. Pink has a wonderful book on the attributes of God. And there are others. There's so many others. And it's, it's very important. Now, so we need to be holy. We need to be a people whose heart is knit to God. Now we go on. And he says, an acceptable sacrifice. Whom do you hope to please? If you seek to please anyone above God, that is idolatry. Even children need to be taught that their obedience to their parents should not primarily be the motivation for that should not be primarily to please their parents. It should be primarily to please God. You see, even someone who, who serves God because God can fix their family, that's idolatry. We serve God because God is worthy, period. Whether He fixes our family or not whether He heals us or not, whether He does anything for us. Our primary goal ought to be to please God. Now, in order to please God, you have to know what God wants. And in order to know what God wants, you have to study His Word. I know, uh, I know people who sincerely, sincerely are Christians. And they sincerely have a passion for wanting to please God. But they will oftentimes do the very things that God most dislikes. And it's not because they necessarily have a rebellious heart as it is, as the Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They just assume that this is okay with God, but they have not checked it out. Now, so we want to be pleasing to God. Now look at this. He talks about our making ourselves a sacrifice, offering ourselves as a sacrifice, and then he says which is your spiritual 
service of worship. Now, when we talk about worship, and um, last night I believe Brother Brother Deutscher was discussing this with me, talking about gospel worship from Burroughs. Um, we always think of singing. And, and singing most certainly is a beautiful form of worship. But that's just one tiny aspect of worship. Worship is when you lay down your life. That's worship. Worship is service. Worship is obedience. Every moment of your life should be worship. Doing the will of God is worship. And look what he says. He says, presenting your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God is your spiritual service of worship. You want to provide, you want to give spiritual worship to God? I believe what we heard today was spiritual worship. There seemed to be a beauty about it. There was a beauty about it. It was, it was real worship. But even that kind of worship in a life that is not laid down is not worship. See, laying down our life, giving ourselves. It's like, it's like, look at it this way. Sometimes we think, you know, a man will think, well, I love my wife because I give her flowers the first day of every month. But he may also beat her, mistreat her, talk bad about her. Those flowers mean nothing. His I love you's on all those cards, they're, they're worthless. It's the same way. We can do acts of worship, but if we have not laid down our life and we are not laying down our life and we are not struggling and seeking to be more and more conformed to the will of God, then we're really not worshiping. Do you see? Remember what Jesus said? These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, the most perfect thing is let's honor him with our lips. And let's have our heart close to him. And now this this term here, our spiritual service of worship, the most spiritual thing you can do is lay down your life. But the word also can be translated rational. It's the most rational thing that you can do. You know what's irrational? This is what's irrational to say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. That he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father through him. That every moment not lived for him is a wasted moment. I believe all that, but I'm going to live in a way that contradicts it. Now, that is irrational. That's like when I go to the, the person who calls himself an agnostic, and I say, You're not an agnostic. He goes, What do you mean I'm not an agnostic? I said, Well, do you. If you are an agnostic, you're extremely irrational. And he says, well, why? I said, listen, the idea of God, the existence of God is the most important truth that there is. If there is a possibility, even the most remote possibility that there is a God, it is the most important truth for a man to discover. And you saying that you're an agnostic, you are at least acknowledging there is a possibility that there is a God. And yet, that being the most important truth, you don't seek it out. You're nonchalant about it. That's insane. That's like screaming out a house is on fire and staying in the house. You see, the most rational, the most irrational thing that you can do, or at least one of them, is to lay down your life to follow a man. I mean, that's insane. That's what a cult is. But the most rational thing you can do is to lay down your life to follow Christ. It's the most rational. What's irrational is to make a claim to Christ and then seek all these different things in the world. It's just totally irrational. Or to do things that contradict the will of God. Now, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. 
what does it mean, this world? The word can also be translated, this age. Paul refers to it in other places as this present age or this present evil age. The world refers to basically, not, not to the grass and the trees and the wilderness and the oceans and things like that that are so beautiful. The world refers to every idea, every act, every concept, Um, every motivation, every influence, every affection, everything that contradicts the will of God. And we look at at our world, we look at our age, and, and that's what we see, don't we? When you turn on the nightly news, or you watch anything on television, or you just... You know, go to the universities and all these different places. What do you see? You just see an entire world running the opposite direction of God. Fighting against God. Making decisions totally contrary to the will of God. And eventually decisions that lead to absolute absurdities. And what he's saying is don't be conformed to that. You see, Paul is recognizing here how powerful The world's influence is. And why is it so powerful? It's it's very difficult for a person to swim up against the current. It's very difficult when the entire, almost entire mass of humanity is going in one direction and encouraging one another in that direction, applauding one another in that direction, and for you to turn and walk the other way, not only is difficult, but it causes those people to be angry with you. And even people in the church to judge you. And to not like you, and to say terrible things about you. And to eventually, and it will probably come a time in Canada and the United States, to lock you up to persecute you, to take away your children. You see? This world has a great and powerful influence. Another way in which the world really gets in on us is through the eyes. Look over for a moment. Hold your place in Romans and go to 1 John. Chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world. Now look, look at the way this is set out for us. The lust of the flesh. Now, the word lust here, what is translated as lust, it's a proper translation, but the word can mean just desire. And desire is not necessarily bad. For example, a desire for food, that's not bad. But an extreme desire of food, taking food as pleasure, becoming a glutton, that's sin. So so what it's talking about here, it's just everything that has to deal with the flesh. And there are some things that, that we desire as human beings that aren't bad, but when they take the place of God, become more important than God, then they become a wicked, horrible thing. I mean, even the, even the study of, of uh, even ministry can become something of a lust of the flesh. You know, I know young men that start studying a little bit of theology and they, boy, they just start devouring it because they can use what they know to devour other students. <laughs> you know, so even good things can become bad, but there's this, this lust of the flesh is so powerful. Do you know that I've been told that there is more uh, chemical things going on in a person who looks at pornography than a person who is on even things like cocaine? These powerful things that can grab a hold of you. Okay? And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, what we see with our eyes, especially men, so extremely dangerous. So extremely dangerous. That's why we're supposed to guard our heart. We're to guard our eyes. You know, I don't go to malls. I'm back home or whatever. If, if, you know, 
every once in a while I have to go someplace to find something. But basically, I'm not going to go to a mall and I'm not going to take my children, my boys, especially to a mall. Because what was 25 years ago, what was considered pornographic is now put in their windows. You see, I know, no, there are certain things you just don't go there. You just don't go there. You just don't do that kind of thing. Why? Because I don't want I don't want to deal with it. I got enough to deal with instead of putting myself in the middle of it. You see, people say, well, you can't you can't just hide from everything. No, but I don't have to pump it into my home. You see, it's the lust of the eyes and, and the boastful pride of life, all that we, you know, we just want to appear as something great in the eyes of other people. And as I've said, the eyes of other people that we don't even necessarily like. You know, we want the biggest and the best and the flashiest and the shiniest and the, the homes and this and that and everything else. And it's just not right. It, it's not right and it does not satisfy. It ultimately does not make you happy. As a matter of fact, when I was coming here with my family... Uh, I, I watched this couple that were sitting right across from us in the airport. And uh, you could tell. They were, they were probably my age, man and a woman. I mean, he had a perfect haircut. Uh, he, everything he had on and his clothes were in style. It was all just a super, you know, brand or something that people wear. The lady... Her, her clothes probably cost more than my car. And she had, you know, she had her hairdo, perfect makeup, and even their travel stuff. I mean, it was designer travel stuff, and they all had their Kindles out, and they were just, man, they were cool. And I could just, but I'd look at the expressions on their face. I saw almost no joy. And, and hard looks, and... You see, they, they, they had what everybody's seeking for. And they weren't happy. You could see they weren't happy. I mean, everything was so intricate for them. They had to have the best of the best, the finest of the finest. And when that went out of style, they had to make sure to send that to Goodwill and go buy something else. It, it's just, it's It's horrid. Well, he says, look, don't be conformed. Let's go back to Romans. He says, don't be conformed to this. And the word conformed here means don't be pressed in the same mold. Now, here's how people get pressed into the same mold. Let's start from the very beginning with children. Children follow children. I don't know if you've noticed that. If you haven't, then, well, you need to. A child is born. And nowadays, maybe after six weeks or six months or something, mom goes back to work and the child goes to preschool. Or this nursery. And that child is raised by another woman who may not have any of the Christian virtues that the mom declares to have. But here's what becomes more amazing. The teacher doesn't even become the primary influence in that child's life. The other kids do. And that's why when he gets old enough, when he comes home at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock or whenever it is, his great desire the whole time he's in home, at home is to get out of home and get back with his friends. And then you send them off to public school. And this is even increases now. They want to be with their friends. They want to play sports with their friends. They want to go out in the yard with their friends. They want to do everything with friends. And family becomes a burden. Their little brother, they no more want him around than a man on the moon. They want to be with their friends. They don't want to be with mom and dad at 5 o'clock to eat supper. And what happens is, eventually the home turns into just a condo with individuals living in it who all have their separate rooms. And the kid comes home and goes to his separate room. And the family is obliterated. But here's what happens. The primary influence on that child's life, what is shaping that child, is not his father. 
It's not his mother. It's not even his teachers. That'll, that'll begin sometime around university. But it's the other kids. Other kids who, when they were nine, were exposed, or eight, were exposed to their father's pornography. And so your child is going to learn about sex, not from you, but in a filthy, dirty, secret way from some other child. And then this child is going to be there eight hours a day at least, five days a week, being taught by teachers who are secular in their mind, being taught by kids who are not only secular, but very perverted. And you know this is true. Young men, gentlemen who went to public school like me, where did you learn all your filth? From your home? And then, the father's not going to disciple. The mother's not going to disciple. The father will yell a lot when the kid doesn't turn out like the father wanted. Father may take him fishing some. And, of course, he'll go paint pictures of Noah's Ark every Sunday. So, all that, that's all the training he gets. And then you wonder, why is this child conformed to the age? And then, throw in television. Average is what? In North America now, three hours a day. Even the cartoons are grotesque. SpongeBob is an abomination. And so, what's happening? We are doing the exact opposite of what God told us to do. But then we come together and pray for revival. So, so this goes on. Then the kid goes to the university where universities have basically, even when I was in the university 150 years ago, <laughs> it, was a, it was a meat market. It was an immoral meat market. And in the last 25 years, it is, it is degraded so much more, it's unbelievable. It is a Sodom and Gomorrah. And the professors... Give a secular worldview. There is no God. There is no right and wrong. And your child does that. And then he comes out and gets a job. And as most of you men who work know what a struggle you have in your jobs, because you're not like these preachers like me, just always kind of protected. You're out there working with people who curse and swear and tell vile jokes and everything else. And even as a grown man who wants to follow Christ and is reading the Word, you know how difficult it is to resist it and you know that you've been influenced by it. And yet the child gets thrown into that. So we have actually effectively lost. We have done everything that God told us not to do. Television, internet, everything in the home, and bam, look what you've got. You have not only allowed someone to come in, you've allowed them to come in with the mold and you've helped them to press it down upon your children. And it's just one generation after another. You see, it's just true. I can't say anything else. I don't know what to do for you. I know that it's a battle in my own home, but I'm telling you, this is, it's not a mystery. Remember I talked about the guy with the bloody forehead? I'm not a doctor, but there it is. And to change things, it's going to require a radical, 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 change in you in you don't be conformed to this world you know even uh, our media guy John Green he, he called me in the office in his office one day and he goes Paula wants you to see this and it was a trailer you know a movie trailer for Spider-Man I don't know one two three or something something like that he said just look at this it was 45 seconds now I looked at it there was nothing immoral at all about, you know, Spider-Man jumping from one place to another. But here was the thing that, that he was pointing out to me. After 45 seconds of watching that trailer, I was literally out of breath. 
I mean, that thing, that guy was jumping all over the place. Music was bombarding me. It was so exciting. I mean, it was. It was exciting. It was visual. It was powerful. It was, wow. Where can I get one of those suits? (laughs) I mean, it was it was amazing. Now, here's the problem. A child is raised in that. And he can no longer walk through a forest and see any beauty. He can no longer be excited by a sunset. You take a video game, a little child is playing and and a guy is shooting people. I mean, I've seen these things when I've walked like through a through Walmart. They have them sometimes or different places. And I mean, shooting people. I mean, guys are getting hit in the chest. Blood's going everywhere. The little kid thinks it's fun. I scored more points. And then one day he picks up a gun and he pulls a trigger. But the moment that chest explodes, he finds out something. It's not like the game. That's why I go around and I talk about these things. I talk to young people. I say, young people, you know that game where you pull the trigger and you shoot all those guys? They go, yeah. I go, I have been there. I have grabbed a man off the floor with his chest blown out through his back. Taking towels and jamming it in the hole while blood is covering my body, trying to keep him alive. Passing out, gripping a hold of him so that the... The, 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 the policemen have to literally grab my arms and hit them because I'm totally locked in on this guy and can't move. I said, I know what it's like and I still want to throw up every time I think about it. You see, but we conform our children to this age and they don't see that. They become desensitized. You know, isn't it, wouldn't it be neat, girls? If you did reach for a book like I was talking yesterday and a boy reached for the book at the same time and he touched your hand and it caused you to lose your breath, wouldn't that be wonderful to feel something like that? You can't when you allow the world in and it desensitizes you. You can't read poetry anymore. You can't think of beauty. You can't think of purity. And you can't think of love without soiling it. We're not supposed to be a dirty people. We're supposed to be an innocent people. One time when when my son, he probably doesn't even remember, he was so little, a man, I was walking through a church and the man said to him, wow, you're a, you're a big boy and you're a fine looking boy. I bet you got a lot of girlfriends. I said, sir, step aside. He said, don't you ever talk to my son like that again. Do you understand me? He said, well, I don't know what the problem is. Well, I'm going to tell you what the problem is. My little boy is supposed to be thinking about tree houses and slaying dragons and hunting for birds with his broken BB gun. And I will not stand here while he is soiled by someone as foolish as you. The Bible tells me to protect his innocence. Do not allow love to be awakened too early. You say, man, you can be kind of mean. Look, it's, it's time that some men got some backbone back. It really is. I'm just, I'm tired of all these tame, domesticated males. Goodness gracious, there's something to fight for. And at times there is something to be angry about and sin not. And the protection of our children is one of them. There ought to be a sense in which you're like a pit bull. With rabies. <laughs> Do not be conformed to this world. Men, one of our responsibilities is to keep ourselves pure so we can keep our families pure. One of our responsibilities, men, is to stand at the door 
and tell the world, no, you're not coming in. I may not whip you in a fight, but I can tell you this, they're going to be carrying both of us off in an ambulance. You've got to stand your ground on this matter. Now, it goes on, do not be conformed to this world, but, but, this is just a big, this term now is just coming in here and goes, I'm going to show you the complete opposite now. He says, but, but, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word transformed in Greek is the word from which we get metamorphosis. You see, the world tries to put this mechanical mold upon you. But God says, I want to transform you, to metamorphosize you, to make you into something beautiful, to, to change you. It's, it's spiritual, it's life, it's power, it's not mechanical. Be transformed. Okay, every one of us want to be transformed. We do, it's our longing. And most of us, like myself, if we have any sadness, if we are sad because we are not as transformed as we would hope to be. I look at my life. I'm going to be 50 in a few months. And I look back and I think, I'm just, I just thought I would have made more progress by now. And it hurts. But that's one of the signs that you're a Christian. That you mourn a bit. That you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see. Love to tell this story. I was walked into the office of T.W. Hunt. He's, a, he's probably in his 90s now. He uh, was known and is known as the man of prayer. He teaches on prayer. But he would pray for his students three hours a day. Very, very godly. And I walked into his office one day as a seminary student and I'm just like, just depressed. And I walk in his office and, and uh, Dr. Hunt looks at me and he just went, Paul, sit down. What's wrong? And I said, Dr. Hunt, I'm just not holy. I just don't know the word. I'm just this and I'm not this. And I want to be more like Christ and I'm just miserable. He just looked at me and he goes. And he stands up and walks over and he puts both his hands on my shoulders. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pronounce you blessed. And he went and sat down. And I was like, kind of like a deer looking in the headlights type look, you know. And he goes, Paul, you don't understand what I just did. And I said, no, Dr. Hunt, I did, do not understand. And he said, have you never read blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. He said, Paul, if you came in here totally content, I would fear for your soul that you were even converted. But here you are, hungering and thirsting and miserable for a lack of righteousness. Paul, that's the very sign that you are blessed of God. Brothers, I know that, that you're sitting there and you've heard some of the things I've said. And your heart is broken. You're thinking, man. Uh, but please understand, I say these things not because they hurt you, but because it's what you need to hear. But I also say these things because it's what I need to hear. You see, there's no difference between us. This is truth. I think I preach on it so much not because I think there's a whole bunch of men out there that need to hear it. I preach on it so much because I need to hear it. One of the things that I always have realized that wise men have taught me is Paul, preach to yourself. Don't let yourself preach to you, but preach the Word of God to yourself. And, and brothers, we need this. I need this. You need these rebukes. I need these rebukes. I mean, I'm sorry, we do. But boy, I would be in danger without them. He says, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. 
there are two things here that we ought to see. You know, in the book of Proverbs, we are told, the young man is told to guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. When he says guard your heart, he's talking again. You know, he's using this Hebrew terminology, the, the, the heart, the mind, guard it. Because, because it's going to determine everything. It's the control center. Guard it. You know, and you, you put... You put filth into it. And it's just going to be filthy. So there's one thing in which innocence... You know, there was a group of men when I lived in Illinois. It's a Mennonite community. And... Um, would go up there and buy wood from them when I would want to build some furniture or work on a build a longbow or something. And they would always have hickory and poplar and cherry and different wood. And I'd travel up there with my trailer and I'd buy some wood. You know what I always loved about being there? I'd sometimes sit there with those Mennonite men. The one thing that would stick out in my mind, and I know that not all Mennonites are Christians and that many are steeped in legalism and things like that, but these men always amazed me when they sat around and talked because it was almost like some little children talking. They were so, in a sense, innocent to all the things going out in the world, going on in the world. It was like they didn't even know about it. Brothers, we shouldn't think that strange. Jesus tells us through his word to be like babies with regard to evil. You know, one of the things that one of the things that so amazed me is when it's amazing when you raise your children and you say, look, I don't want my children to be watching these types of things. People will actually get mad at me and they'll say, well, how is your child supposed to know about these things in order to fight against? I'm going, where did you get this? You didn't get this out of the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell my sons that in order to be godly, they must be experts in evil. But innocent, especially my daughters. Listen, young ladies. There, and, and, and young men, when you marry, there's a sense in which you stand at the door that there are things that go on in this world, young men, that you're going to have to fight against that you shouldn't even tell your wife about. She shouldn't have to be defiled by these things because you protect her from them. And see, again, the feminist will say, well, that's pathetic, and she'll just be a brainless one. No. no, she'll be a pure and undefiled young lady. You know, even they tell me the, the special services in the United States that, that look out after uh, confeder um, false money. It says, you know, you know how they train them. They, they don't ever let them touch a false bill. They put them in a room and pass real money through their hands for months and months and months. And then after months and months of them just touching real dollar bills, they put a fake one in and they spot it that quick. Not because they know what's fake, but because they know what's true. They, I don't know what this is, but it's not a real bill. And they discard it. And, and, and that's the way that we need to be. We need to be innocent. Really. Men, those of you who were saved later in life, like myself, wouldn't you give anything if, if you could just forget some of the things? I mean, to be renewed in our mind begins with shutting the bad things out. You know, because, listen to me, you, if you have a quiet time that lasts an hour, in which you're meditating on the Word an hour, and most people don't have any of that, if you had a, an hour's worth of meditating in the Word of God and then you spend the next 15 hours of your day showering in filth, it's not going to do you any good. So first of all, you have to make a decision that I will not look upon the evil thing. I will not listen to this kind of stuff. And then renew your mind in the Word. We are a people... We're a Bible-thumping people that ought to thump it a lot less and open it a lot more. We talk about the Word, the Word, the Word, but, but really. 
I was even thinking about conferences, conferences that even Heart Cry has given. And, and after our last conference, we haven't had one in years, I thought about this. I thought, you know, I think what we did was wrong. See, when a conference, and this one hasn't been that way, but when a conference is so busy that the people do not even have time to get up in the morning and read their Bible. <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, I think the next time we have a conference, we're going to have a thing where, okay, you know, this is the time set aside in the morning before we even start for you to have uh, time to pray with your family and to read the Word. You know? Because, because it's really about that, isn't it? It's about renewing our mind. And renewing our mind in all Sorts of beautiful things. You know, hold your place and go to Philippians for a moment. Look at chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Think on these things. See, in, in, in our lives, well, let, let me give you an example. You know, you, you take a group of kids to the university or the museum, or some museum, whether it be in, in New York or London or wherever, Toronto and say that there is a, a, a entire display of French Impressionism. Monet, Renoir, others. The children are going to look at that and go, you know, who cares? Why? That's why we have art appreciation, right? To teach people how to appreciate the finer things. That's why we have music appreciation to teach children to appreciate Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Now, listen very, very carefully. By and large, in North America, Canada, United States, we do not teach our children to appreciate anything of beauty. One of our tasks is to, pre to teach them to appreciate whatever is true, to see the value in it, to rejoice in it. That is our job. To teach them to appreciate and desire that which is honorable and that which is right. To teach them to see the spectacular nature of that which is pure and lovely. To be able to understand and discern beauty. What is of good report and excellence and worthy of praise? We're to renew our minds in the Word of God, in the Bible, and in all things beautiful. To learn to appreciate that. You know, I can see this even in restaurants in America. I don't know how you are in Canada, but in America, in the United States, I can see this. People, by and large, do not care to eat good food. But they'll go to a restaurant where it's all you can eat, and it looks like a bunch, it looks like a hog trough. Honestly, the food is horrid, but they don't care because they can get all that they can eat. That is. That is Roman Empire Greek gluttony, my friend. So, so to sit down at a restaurant in which everything is prepared from scratch and there's several different courses and they're all very small and to actually put a piece of food in your mouth and to taste it and to relish the different flavor, that's totally foreign to us. We'd be like, where's the meat? Got no gravy? I mean, do you see what we are? I mean, look at this. You, you, this is not... When you look at such things as the Victorian era in Europe, in England, 
There's some good things and really bad things about that. The beauty that you can see there, all is a result of truths learned from Scripture. But the sad thing about it is, it was right there where they began to say basically, where they reaped all these benefits of reformations and Puritans and everything else, and at that moment began to deny those very things and become secular. So that in just a little while it turned into nothing. Someone said this about Benjamin Franklin. That Benjamin Franklin's grandparents were Puritans. With Puritan theology and Puritan ethics, morals. That Benjamin Franklin's parents wanted the Puritan ethics or morality without the Puritan God and the Puritan theology. And then Benjamin Franklin wanted neither. He did not care for the morals or for the God. You see, I always like to tell people this. You know, they say, do you realize that before Christianity came into Europe, most of us are probably find our ancestors in Europe. Before Christianity came into Europe, I mean, our, our ancestors were all running around naked, painting themselves blue and eating one another. Abominations. Abominations. They were. What changed everything? The advent of Christianity. Now, even though at the beginning it was, it was a Catholicism, which was wrong and everything else, but it did pave a way. You had the Reformation. You had other things going on. And you see a civilization produce some of the finest art finest music, beauty, all these things. And then at the height of it, they deny the God who granted them all that, turned away from His Word, and now what do you have? Grunge. Punk. Every filthy thing that can be described in Scripture. So here's what I want you to see. If a revival breaks out, But it does not bleed down into changing everything about our life, including art, everything. Then it does not have an impact. When Christianity, when a reformation, when revival comes, it should change absolutely everything about us and make us a noble people. And we should strive for that. But we strive for it not by gathering a whole bunch of rules. We strive for it by looking at Christ. Looking at Christ. By by renewing our mind in the Word of God. Now, young men and young women, listen to me. And we'll close on this. With regard to the Word, I, I want to give you an illustration. Let's say that you're a young girl or a young man And you're standing right here. And I tell you to cross the room. That's all I do. I said, will you please cross the room and go to the other corner? You'll go, sure. And so you'll just kind of nonchalantly walk across the room. All right, I'm here. Now let's change the scenario. I say, stand in that corner right there. Put your feet exactly where I tell you. Now, I want you to walk across the room. But I want you to know that there are over a hundred landmines built into the floor. If you step on one of them, they will kill you. What's going to happen? You're going to, you're going to stand in the corner and you're not going to move. If you have any sense to you, you are going to stand in the corner and you are not going to move. You are going to be in utter terror knowing that even right now you could move your foot one inch and you're going to die because you don't know where the landmines are. You're in utter terror. That's where I want you to be right now. In utter terror. Paralyzed. But now, I want you to mature. And I'm going to say here, here's a map. On this map is outlined exactly what you must do not to die. If you will just follow this, 
you'll make it across the room. Now, it's going to take courage. It's going to take a lot of study. A lot of reading of this map. A lot of memorizing of this map. It's going to take obedience to this map. It's not going to be one step you're going to obey and the next step you're just going to do what you want to do. It's going to be obedience. And so there you go. Two steps forward. You take two steps forward. Three steps to the right. Three steps to the right. And with fear and trembling, as Paul talks about in Philippians, you make your way across the room. I just described to you, young person, I just described to you life. Now, most of you, and I'm going to tell you this because I love you, you are foolish. You are fools. Let me give you some other terms. You are the simple. You are the naive. All these terms come out of the book of Proverbs to young people. That's what the Bible calls young people. Really, it is. Now, young person, you will become wise in one second if you'll just do one thing. Say, that's true. It's true. I am that. I acknowledge it. All right, I acknowledge it. I am. I'm that. Okay, I agree. All right, you are just on the path now to wisdom. Fear of the Lord. God, I'm not going to make it across this life, across this room. And then with fear and trembling, you begin to study His Word and to walk circumspectly, as Paul says in Ephesians. And you'll make it. You'll make it. All right, let's pray. Father, I come before You and I ask You, Lord, to help us. I especially pray for the children that the grace given us as parents would seem almost as no grace at all compared to the grace given our children. That they would be wiser in the Scriptures that they would be more innocent with regard to evil, that they would be more true, more noble, more like Christ. They would possess the ability to discern beauty from ugliness, purity from filth, good from evil. Father, help them and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Parents, one last thing so important. Because of the way I was raised and because of my slow start and everything else, I will never become probably the man that I could have become. I'll never climb the mountain all the way. But here's what I can do. I can climb the mountain as far as I can with my family on my back. And when they take off to run their race, maybe they'll be light years ahead of me. You want to give your children the things you never had? I don't. Most of what I've had, I do not want to give my children. And most of the things the world wants to give children, I do not want to give mine. I do not care if they go to the university. I do not care if they have wealth. I do not care if the world likes them. The one thing I want to give my children is a ride on my back as far as I can up a mountain so that when they take off, they're farther ahead of their father and their mother. That's what you can give your children. God bless.